Live from News 4 New York, this is a special report. Good evening, I'm Adam Cooperstein. We're coming to you on the air live right now to bring you breaking news this morning. New York Attorney General Letitia James holding a news conference right now, calling this a major announcement. And we have learned she is filing a lawsuit against former President Donald Trump and his family members. Let's listen in right now. That were submitted by Mr. Trump and others. I am announcing that today we are filing a lawsuit against Donald Trump for violating the law as part of his efforts to generate profits for himself, his family, and his company. The complaint demonstrates that Donald Trump falsely inflated his net worth by billions of dollars to unjustly enrich himself and to cheat the system, thereby cheating all of us. He did this with the help of the other defendants, his children. Donald Trump Jr., Ivanka Trump, and Eric Trump, and former Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg and Trump Organization controller Jeffrey McConney. Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization repeatedly and persistently manipulated the value of assets to induce banks to lend money to the Trump Organization on more favorable terms than would otherwise have been available to the company, to pay lower taxes, to satisfy continuing loan agreements, and to induce insurance companies to provide insurance coverage for higher limits and at lower premiums. That will be a, a sad day for His conduct was all in violation of Executive Law, Section 6312, which gives the Attorney General broad and special powers to go after persistent and repeated fraud and illegality. As part of demonstrating illegality under that section of Law 6312, we show that they violated several state criminal laws, including falsifying business records, issuing false financial statements, insurance fraud, and engaging in a conspiracy to commit each of these state law violations. We believe the conduct alleged in this action also violates federal criminal law, including issuing false statements to financial institutions and bank fraud. And we are referring those criminal violations that we've uncovered to the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York and the Internal Revenue Service. As a result of these violations, we are asking the court to, among other things, permanently bar Mr. Trump, Donald Trump Jr., Ivanka Trump, Eric Trump, from serving as an officer or director in any corporation or similar, similar entity registered and or licensed in New York, to bar Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization from entering into any New York State commercial real estate acquisition or from applying for loans from any financial institution in New York for five years to pay for the financial benefits obtained as a result of the persistent fraudulent practices at an estimated $250 million. Towards the end of my, Iraq, my remarks, I will go into the other relief that we are seeking. At the center of this, of the year-long financial scheme, were the statements of financial condition that were prepared annually by and for Mr. Trump, specifically from 2011 to 2021. These statements were compiled by the Trump Organization executives and were issued as a compilation report by Mr. Trump's accounting firm. The statements are explicit that the preparation was the responsibility of Mr. Trump. We're starting in 2016, the trustees of his trust, Donald Trump Jr. and Alan Weisselberg, for the sole beneficiary, for the sole benefit of Mr. Donald Trump. Each statement was personally certified as accurate by Mr. Trump or by one of his trustees as part of the loan process with the intent that the information 
in the statement would be relied upon by banks and insurers. Mr. Trump and Mr. Weisselberg would meet to review and approve the final statement every year. Mr. Trump made known through Alan Weisselberg that he wanted his net worth reflected on the statements to increase, a desire Mr. Weisselberg and others carried out year after year in their fraudulent preparation of the statements. And when asked about these meetings under oath as part of our deposition, both men, Mr. Trump and Mr. Weisselberg, invoked their Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination, and they refused to answer. When asked under oath if he, Mr. Trump, continued to review and approve the statements after becoming President of the United States in 2017, Mr. Trump, again, invoked his Fifth Amendment privilege and refused to answer. Over the course of our investigation, we found that Mr. Trump, his children, the Trump Organization, created and used more than 200 false and misleading asset valuations on his statement of financial condition over that 10-year period. They issued statements that were in clear violation of general accepted principles in the general accounting principles in the United States despite representing that these statements were prepared in accordance with these principles. Some of the common tactics they used include representing that Mr. Trump had cash on hand that he did not have, ignoring critical restrictions that would significantly impact property values when setting valuations, changing the methodology used to value properties from year to year without reason or notice, and using vastly different methods to value different properties even in the same year, and including tangible items such as brand premiums, the Trump premium, when calculating an asset's value, despite the fact that they ignored the advice of outside professionals. They also ignored the advice and, uh, and, it, and appraisals of outside professionals, despite claiming those individuals provided certain figures. For example, they received a series of bank ordered appraisals for the commercial property at 40 Wall Street in New York City that calculated the value of the property at $200 million as of August 2010 and $220 million as of November 2012. Yet, in his 2011 statement, Mr. Trump listed 40 Wall Street with a value of $524 million, which increased to $530 million over the next two years, more than twice the value calculated by the professionals. Even more egregious, the $500 million plus valuation was attributed to information from the appraiser who valued the building at just over $200 million. Another deceptive strategy they employed was to use objectively false numbers to calculate property values. Take Mr. Trump's triplex. You know, the triplex apartment in Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue? Mr. Trump represented that his apartment spanned more than 30,000 square feet, which was the basis for valuing the apartment. In reality, the apartment had an area of less than 11,000 square feet, something that Mr. Trump was well aware of. And based on that inflated square footage, the value of the apartment in 2015 and 2016 was $327 million. To this date, no apartment in New York City has ever sold for close to that amount. Tripling the size of the apartment for purposes of the valuation was intentional and deliberate fraud, not an honest mistake. Mr. Trump was intimately familiar with the layout of both the building and the apartment, having personally overseen the construction of both. 
Despite his sworn testimony before invoking his Fifth Amendment privilege, Mr. Weisselberg conceded that using the false square footage improperly inflated the value of the apartment almost threefold. Mr. Weisselberg admitted that this amounted to an overstatement of, give or take, $200 million. Misrepresenting the size of the apartment was only one of the many ways that Mr. Trump intentionally misvalued his asset for the purposes of increasing his net worth and inducing banks to offer more favorable terms. Mr. Trump also routinely ignored legal restrictions on development rights and marketability on properties that would significantly decrease property values. For example, let's take Trump Park Avenue in New York. This building contains both commercial and residential space. The unsold residential condo units owned by Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization represented the lion's share of the reported value for this property. Mr. Trump and his children intentionally ignored legal restrictions on some of the units that would have had, that would have drastically changed the valuation. Specifically, the 12, 12 of those units were actually rent-stabilized apartments. A professional appraiser valued those 12 units at around $750,000, noting that the rent-stabilized units cannot be marketed as individual units for sale because the current tenants cannot be forced to leave. Despite this professional valuation, and Mr. Trump knowing full well the legal restrictions the 12 rent-stabilized units were valued, he valued them collectively on his statements at $49 million. That is about 65 times the appraised valuation. Mr. Trump also blatantly ignored legal restrictions at Mar-a-Lago. Mar-a-Lago was valued on the false premise that it sat on unrestricted property and could be developed for residential use. However, Mr. Trump knew that Mar-a-Lago was subject to a host of onerous restrictions and limitations. Mr. Trump himself signed deeds sharply restricting changes to the property and donating his residential development rights in an effort to get a tax deduction and later to lower his property taxes on the property. The deeds also require Mr. Trump to donate over 23 percent of Mar-a-Lago's value to the Historic Trust for Historic Preservation if he ever sold it. Despite these significant restrictions, Mr. Trump valued the property based on the false premise that it was an unrestricted residential 18-acre plot of land that could be sold and used as a private home. In fact, the valuations represent that these restrictions don't even exist. The club generated annual revenues of less than $25 million and should have been valued at more than, valued at about $75 million. However, Mar-a-Lago was valued as high as $739 million. Mr. Trump used inappropriate schemes to inflate the value of his other golf clubs. He valued the clubs based on their fixed assets, in other words, the money spent to acquire and to maintain them, despite being informed by valuation professionals that this practice was inappropriate for a club operating as an ongoing business. He again added a brand premium when determining the value of the club, but claimed in his statements that he did not. And he in inflated the value of unsold memberships, often by hundreds of thousands of dollars per membership, even in situations where the memberships were given away for free at Mr. Trump's direction. Inflating his reported net worth was just the first part of the scheme. He then used these false statements of financial condition for his own personal gain. Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization have obtained hundreds of millions of dollars in real estate loans and insurance coverage using these statements. 
Mr. Trump was able to secure much more favorable loan terms by personally guaranteeing the loans based on his reported net worth, as reflected on his statements of financial condition. These statements were key, integral to Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization's ability to secure loans for a number of properties, including the old post office in Washington, D.C. Mr. Trump's statements were first submitted to the federal government to demonstrate his financial status, his net worth. He then engaged with Deutsche Bank to obtain a loan to redevelop the property. Mr. Trump was able to obtain much more favorable loan terms by personally guaranteeing the loans. So in 2014, he secured a loan from Deutsche Bank for $170 million. And as you know, in May of 22, the, Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization, they sold the post office, the old post office property, for $375 million, resulting in a $100 million net profit, which was the result of a loan he was able to obtain through the use of false and misleading statements of financial condition. Separately, Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization saved an estimated $150 million by receiving favorable interest rates that were only provided based on the false and misleading statements of financial condition. We also believe that he illegally saved millions of dollars in federal tax benefits, conservation easement donations related to Seven Springs in Westchester and the Trump National Golf Club in Los Angeles. And this conduct is not the subject of this action, but we are referring it to the IRS and to the Southern District of New York. The examples I laid out uh, just barely scratch the surface of the misconduct that we have uncovered. The complaint, which all of you should have a copy, is more than 280 pages long. It includes examples from 23 assets that were grossly and fraudulently inflated. And those inflated values were used on Mr. Trump's statements almost every year. All told, we uncovered more than 200 examples of false and misleading asset valuations that were used on his statements. The pattern of fraud and deception that was used by Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization for their own financial benefit is astounding. Inflating the values of assets by whatever means necessary to increase Mr. Trump's purported net worth. And then that net worth, net worth was used to further enhance his financial standing, intentionally misrepresenting his, financial, his financials to obtain incredible economic benefit. It was a scheme that, by its very nature, became more profitable over time. And it is all in stark violation of the law. As I mentioned earlier, um, the relief that we are seeking specifically, we are asking the court, again, to permanently bar Mr. Trump, Donald Trump, Eric Trump, Ivanka Trump, from serving as an officer or director in any corporation or similar business entity registered or licensed in New York State. We are barring Mr. Trump and his organization from entering into any New York State commercial real estate acquisition for five years. We are barring Mr. Trump and the Trump organization from applying for any loans from any financial institution registered with the New York Department of Financial Services for five years. We are requiring Mr. Trump and the Trump organization to to disgorge the financial benefits obtained through the persistent fraudulent practices, an estimated a baseline at the minimum of $250 million, and to an appoint an independent monitor at the Trump Organization to oversee compliance, financial reporting, valuations, and disclosures to lenders, insurers, and tax authorities for no less than five years. We are requiring the Trump Organization to prepare on an annual basis for the next five years a GAP, a generally accepted accounting practices compliant audited statement of financial condition showing Mr. Trump's net worth to be distributed to all the recipients of his prior statements of financial condition. To replace the current trustees of the Donald J. Trump Revocable Trust with new independent trustees or require similar independent governance if a new trust is created, and to permanently bar Alan Weisselberg and Jeffrey McConney from serving in the financial control of any New York corporation. And lastly, to cancel any certificate filed under 
and by virtue of the provisions of Section 130 of the General Business Law for the corporate entities named as defendants and any other entity controlled by or beneficially owned by Donald Trump, which participated in or benefited from the ongoing financial scheme. In other words, permanently prohibit any of these companies from doing business in the state of New York. I want to be clear. White collar financial crime is not a victimless crime. When the well-connected break the law to take in more money that they are entitled to, it reduces resources to working people, to regular people, to small businesses and to tax and all taxpayers. Everyday people cannot lie to a bank about how much money they have in order to get a favorable loan to buy a home or to send their kid to college. And if they did, the government would throw the book at them. Why should this be any different? It is a tale of two justice systems, one for everyday working people and one for the elite, the rich and the powerful. Mr. Trump and his allies may say that these penalties are too harsh or that this is part of a witch hunt. I will remind everyone that this investigation only started after Michael Cohen, the former lawyer, his former lawyer, testified before Congress and shed light on this misconduct. And the remedies are consistent with what we have sought for other businesses that committed the same misconduct. This investigation revealed that Donald Trump engaged in years of illegal conduct to inflate his net worth, to achieve, to deceive banks and the people of the great state of New York. Claiming you have money that you do not have does not amount to the art of the deal. It's the art of the steal. And there cannot be different rules for different people in this country or in this state. And former presidents are no different. And so today we are making good on that promise, on our commitment. Because no one, no one is above the law. And I would like for them to stand. This investigation was led by Senior Enforcement Counsel Kevin Wallace, Senior Counsel Andrew Amer, Assistant Attorney General Colleen Faherty, Assistant Attorney General Alex Finkelstein, Assistant Attorney General Will Handley, Assistant Attorney General Stephanie Torre, Assistant Attorney General Austin Thompson, Special Counsel to the Solicitor General Eric Herron, Enforcement Section Chief Louis Solomon, Legal Support Analyst Samantha Stern. Additional support was provided by a Data Analyst Anusha Chowdhury, Senior Data Analyst A. Akram Hashanoff, Data Scientist Chun Su Song, Deputy Director of Research and Analytics Megan Thorsfeld, Director of Research and Analytics Jonathan White Werberg, as well as Information Technology Specialist Yu Sing Chin and Information Technology Specialist Paige um, Poldoni, Information Technology Specialist John Roach. Appellate support was provided by Deputy Solicitor General Judy Vale, Assistant uh, Solicitor General Eric Del Pozo, all under the oversight of First Deputy Attorney General Jennifer Levy. I thank you for your service. You may have a seat. Now I know that I've provided you with a lot of numbers, a lot of property. Um, members of the team will be available to answer any specific questions, but at this time I'm going to turn it over um, to uh, Delaney, who's going to uh, lead the Q&A on on-topic questions. Thank you. Delaney. Sorry, Jonathan Deans with NBC. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you say that there was criminality involved here. 
I was wondering if you referred this to the Manhattan DA as well, you've been part of that investigation, and should we expect to see state charges out of the Manhattan DA's office? As you know, there, there is a parallel criminal investigation being conducted by the district attorney of Manhattan, and we are cooperating with the Manhattan district attorney and any information that he is requesting, we will submit it to his office. We, we cooperate with any law enforcement agency, including but not limited to um, the Manhattan DA. Thank you. You said that his career and his empire was basically a sham and smoke and mirrors. Can you just describe, are you trying to shut him down and where do we go from here? So um, again, this investigation has to do with his statements of financial condition over a period of 2011 to 2021. Um, and this is uh, an attempt to seek redress uh, for the taxpayers of the great state of New York, for individuals in the great state of New York. And he could um, reconstruct, uh, uh, reorganize a number of these corporations. Um, but the relief that we are seeking from this judge um, is, again, for him to reform his practices in the state of New York and to prohibit him from engaging in any um, real estate commercial transactions in the state of New York going forward. Ms. James, as, as you know, these, oh, I apologize, Henry Rossoff with PIX11. As you know, these allegations are at least three years old. That's the origin of your investigation. The DOJ and IRS have had access to the same starting points that you did. With these referrals, do you hope to, to force their hand into action? It's not a question of forcing their hands. It's a question of prevent, presenting to them evidence, which we believe suggests um, illegality and suggests that um, um, he was engaging in a number of schemes to benefit himself, his corporation, and his family. Um, and so we will present this information to the District Attorney of New York, if he requested, as well as the Southern District of New York and the IRS, based on the allegations that we uncovered, based on the evidence that we uncovered. Harris Canal with CNN. Are you willing to settle with the Trump Organization? And if so, what terms would be appropriate and favorable for you that you would agree to settle? I will not negotiate in public. Um, and as you know, as been publicly reported, we rejected um, settlement offers that they submitted. And our doors are always open. Dana? Uh, Washington Post. Um, yeah. It's been suggested by Mr. Trump and his advocates that they were engaging in standard practices. This is standard in a real estate business. Um, how is what they were doing different from standard practice here? And uh, can you comment on their that that defense? That's so this, offering? you know, this conduct can not be brushed aside and dismissed as some sort of good faith mistake. Um, the statements um, of financial condition were greatly exaggerated, grossly inflated, objectively false, and therefore fraudulent and illegal. And as a result of that, we are seeking relief, and, he, and Mr. Trump, the Trump Organization, his family, they should all be held accountable. And that is the purpose of this litigation that we are filing today, in addition to referring the criminal conduct to the Southern District of New York, as well as the IRS. No one, my friend, is above the law. I'm Marcia Kramer from CBS, um, Madam Attorney General. I wonder, I have two part question. Number one, um, is there anything to prevent Mr. Trump from uh, establishing his corporations, even for the properties in New York, in another state, since he has now become a legal resident of Florida? And secondly, you called it. Donald Trump Jr. has already started tweeting that this, quote, the Democratic witch hunt has begun, if you'd like to respond to that as well. So with regards to the name calling, as you know, um, they've uh, basically um, have attempted to delay um, this investigation. Um, and two, federal, two judges have dismissed those claims that this was a political witch hunt. Um, so I give no credence to those um, uh, na to the names that I, he, refer he has referred uh, to me. Um, and two, um, he's, Mr. Trump, the Trump Organization, as well as his family, will still have to deal with this complaint. They will still have to respond. They will still have to respond to the allegations therein. Um, and so if, in fact, he decided to move to Florida, the reality is he still has to deal with the great state of New York and respond to the complaint. But he can't, he cannot, you know, establish another corporation, put these properties in a corporation that he incorporates in another no, state. No, no, he cannot. Any state other than Correct. 
these corporations are currently, currently incorporated in the state of New York. Some are incorporated in Delaware, but they do business in the state of New York. Um, and you cannot just pick up and those same corporations can be moved to Florida. No. And, and again, Marsha, just to, to put a finer point on that, we are attempting, as part of our relief, to dissolve these corporations. Uh, Laura Italiano from Insider. Uh, in practical terms, uh, much of uh, uh, former President Trump's uh, biggest money generating pop properties are in Manhattan, mm -hmm. in New York State. Um, would he, uh, if, this, if this relief is granted by the judge uh, down the road, would he be able to collect rents? to obtain loans on the properties? Uh, what, what precise, you know, what, what practical um, implications to sell the properties should he want to? Is the corporation that's filed in New York necessary for him to do those things? So again, all, most of the corporations are, um, have been incorporated in the state of New York. There are some have that have been incorporated in Delaware, but they continue to do business in the state of New York. We are, again, are permanently uh, barring Mr. Trump and uh, his family members from serving as an officer or director um, in any entity in the state of New York. We are barring him from entering into any commercial real estate transactions for five years. We are barring Mr. Trump and the organization from applying for any loans for five years just for five years, requiring him to repay the financial benefits of $250 million, placing a monitor over um, these corporations, appointing, requiring him to file a gap-compliant um, uh, financial state, a statement of financial condition, replacing the trustees, um, uh, if in fact he creates a new trustee and permanently barring Alan Weisselberg and Jeffrey McConney and canceling his certificate of incorporations um, for those co corporations that we discussed. Yes. Follow up. Mm -hmm. Are these uh, relief that the, a judge would have to approve? Yes. So these things aren't happening at the moment, Correct. but the, this is what will be litigated now down the line. Correct. And it's important also to understand that Mr. Trump will continue to have a financial interest in a lot of these corporations. Um, and so if he decides to, at some point in time, sell them, or if he decides to restructure them, um, again, this is all part of the relief that we are seeking. I said to Marsha that we're seeking to dissolve them. That was incorrect. We're not seeking to dissolve, dissolve them. He still has a financial interest in these businesses and corporation. I mean, he still owns them. Correct. However, to collect rent, to obtain a loan uh, based on them as collateral, to um, sell the property, uh, uh, maybe I'm missing some other practical things. If, if approved by a judge down the road, these are things he would not be able to do with those properties. Correct. For the next five years. We're going to take two more questions. We are watching a live news conference where the New York Attorney General, Letitia James, has announced a $250 million civil lawsuit against Donald Trump, his children, and the Trump Organization, accusing them of widespread business fraud, accusing the, the Trump Organization and the former president of manipulating the value of his assets to pay lower taxes, to secure loans, to lower insurance premiums, among other things. And the attorney general saying today she believes that these actions violate federal criminal law and will now refer them to the Southern District of New York and the IRS. And the attorney general now asking to bar Trump and his children from doing business in New York, from applying for loans in New York, and asking them to pay $250 million in penalties. It's a more than 200-page civil lawsuit. And as this just comes out, we're getting reaction, not from Donald Trump himself just yet, but his son, Donald Trump Jr., again named in this lawsuit, writing on Twitter, the Democratic witch hunt continues. And now we also have a statement from Donald Trump's attorney. Let me read it to you. It says, today's filing is neither focused on the facts nor the law, Rather, it is solely focused on advancing the attorney general's political agenda. It is abundantly clear that the attorney general's office has exceeded its statutory authority by prying into transactions where absolutely no wrongdoing has taken place. We are confident that our judicial system will not stand for this unchecked abuse of authority, and we look forward to defending our client against each and every one of the attorney general's meritless claims.
claims. This is the end of the statement from Trump's attorney. And this is the culmination of Letitia James' three years of investigating Trump and his finances. And if you do want to continue listening to this news conference, we'll keep streaming it on our website, NBCNewYork.com. Actually, it just wrapped up. We're going to have a complete wrap up for you, of course, on the News 4 app and later on in our coverage here on News 4 at 4. And as we continue to watch this, we'll bring any new developments throughout the day on the app, on the website.